The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant, continued, Cassette 11, Side 2. As in China, the position of woman was higher in the earlier than in the later stages of the civilization. Six empresses appear among the rulers of the imperial age, and at Kyoto women played an important, indeed a leading role, in the social and literary life of the nation. In that heyday of Japanese culture, if we may hazard hypotheses in such esoteric fields, the wives outstripped their husbands in adultery and sold their virtue for an epigram. The lady Sei Shonagon describes a youth about to send a love note to his mistress, but interrupting it to make love to a passing girl. And this amiable essayist adds, I wonder if, when this lover sent his letter, tied with a dewy spray of hagi flower, his messenger hesitated to present it to the lady because she also had a guest. Under the influence of feudal militarism and in the natural and historical alternation of laxity and restraint, the Chinese theory of the subjection of woman to man won a wide influence. Society became predominantly male, and women were dedicated to the three obediences, to father, husband, and son. Education, except in etiquette, was rarely wasted upon them, and fidelity was exacted on penalty of death. If a husband caught his wife in adultery, he was authorized to kill her and her paramour at once to which the subtle Ieyasu added that if he killed the woman but spared the man, he was himself to be put to death. The philosopher Eken advised the husband to divorce his wife if she talked too loudly or too long. But if the husband happened to be dissolute and brutal, said Eken, the wife should treat him with doubled kindness and gentleness. Under this rigorous and long-continued training, the Japanese woman became the most industrious, faithful, and obedient of wives, and harassed travelers began to wonder whether a system that had produced such gracious results should not be adopted in the West. Contrary to the most ancient and sacred customs of Oriental society, fertility was not encouraged in samurai Japan. As the population grew, the little islands felt themselves crowded, and it became a matter of good repute in a samurai not to marry before thirty, and not to have more children than two. Nevertheless, every man was expected to marry and beget children. If his wife proved barren, he could divorce her, and if she gave him only daughters, he was admonished to adopt a son, lest his name and property perish, for daughters could not inherit. Children were trained in the Chinese virtues and literature of filial piety, for on this, as the source of family order, rested the discipline and security of the state. The Empress Koken in the 8th century ordered every Japanese household to provide itself with a copy of the classic of filial piety, and every student in the provincial schools or the universities was required to become a master of it. Except for the samurai, whose loyalty to his lord was his highest obligation, filial piety was the basic and supreme virtue of the Japanese. Even his relation to the emperor was to be one of filial affection and obedience. Until the West came, with its disruptive ideas of individual freedom, this cardinal virtue constituted nearly all the moral code of the commoner in Japan. The conversion of the islands to Christianity was made almost impossible by the biblical command that a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Other virtues than obedience and loyalty were less emphasized than in contemporary Europe. Chastity was desirable, and some higher-class women killed themselves when their virginity was threatened, but a single lapse was not synonymous with ruin. The most famous of Japanese novels, the Genji Monogatari, is an epic of aristocratic seduction, and the most famous of Japanese essays, the pillow sketches of the lady Sei Shonagon reads in places like a treatise on the etiquette of sin. The desires of the flesh were looked upon as natural, like hunger and thirst, and thousands of men, many of them respectable husbands, crowded at night the Yoshiwara, or flower district of Tokyo. There, in the most orderly disorderly houses in the world, 15,000 trained and licensed courtesans sat of an evening behind their lattices, gorgeously attired and powder white, ready to provide song, dance, and venery for unmated or ill-mated men. The best educated of the courtesans were the geisha girls, whose very name indicated that they were persons, shah, capable of an artistic performance, gay. Like the hetairai of Greece, they affected literature as well as love, and seasoned their promiscuity with poetry. The shogun Ienari, 1787 to 1836, who had already, in 1791, forbidden mixed bathing as occasionally encouraging immorality, issued a rigorous edict against the geisha in 1822, describing her as a female singer who, magnificently appareled, hires herself out to amuse guests at restaurants, ostensibly by dancing and singing, but really by practices of a very different character. 
These women were henceforth to be classed as prostitutes, along with those numberless wenches who, in Kempfer's day, filled every tea shop in the village and every inn on the road. Nevertheless, parties and families continued to invite the geisha to provide entertainment at social affairs. Finishing schools were established where older geisha trained young apprentices in their varied arts. And periodically, at the Caburenjo, teachers and pupils served ceremonial tea and gave a public performance of their more presentable accomplishments. Parents hard put to support their daughters sometimes, with their manipulated consent, apprenticed them to the geisha for a consideration. And a thousand Japanese novels have told tales of girls who sold themselves to the trade to save their families from starvation. These customs, however startling, do not differ essentially from the habits and institutions of the Occident, except perhaps in candor, refinement, and grace. The vast majority of Japanese girls, we are assured, remained as chaste as the virgins of the West. Despite such frank arrangements, the Japanese managed to live lives of comparative order and decency, and though they did not often allow love to determine marriage for life, they were capable of the tenderest affection for the objects of their desire. Instances are frequent, in the current history as well as in the imaginative literature of Japan, where young men and women have killed themselves in the hope of enjoying in eternity the unity forbidden them by their parents on earth. Love is not the major theme of Japanese poetry, but here and there its note is struck with unmatched simplicity, sincerity, and depth. Oh, that the white waves far out on the sea of Ise were but flowers, that I might gather them and bring them as a gift to my love. And again, with characteristic mingling of nature and feeling, the great Surayuki tells in four lines the story of his rejected love. Naught is so fleeting as the cherry flower, you say. Yet I remember well the hour when life's bloom withered at one spoken word, and not a breath of wind had stirred. 6. The Saints Religion in Japan, the transformation of Buddhism, the priests, skeptics. That same devotion which speaks in patriotism and love, in affection for parents, children, mate, and fatherland, inevitably sought in the universe as a whole some central power to which it might attach itself in loyalty, and through which it might derive some value and significance larger than one person and more lasting than one life. The Japanese are only a moderately religious people, not profoundly and overwhelmingly religious like the Hindus, nor passionately and fanatically religious like the tortured saints of medieval Catholicism or the warring saints of the Reformation. And yet they are distinctly more given to piety and prayer and a happy ending philosophy than their skeptical cousins across the Yellow Sea. Buddhism came from its founder, a cloud of pessimistic exhortation, inviting men to death, but under the skies of Japan it was soon transformed into a cult of protecting deities, pleasant ceremonies, joyful festivals, Rousseauian pilgrimages, and a consoling paradise. It is true that there were hells too in Japanese Buddhism, indeed 128 of them designed for every purpose and enemy. There was a world of demons as well as of saints, and a personal devil, Oni, with horns, flat nose, claws, and fangs. He lived in some dark northeastern realm to which he would now and then lure women to give him pleasure, or men to provide him with proteins. But on the other hand, there were bodhisattvas, ready to transfer to human beings a portion of the grace they had accumulated by many incarnations of virtuous living. And there were gracious deities like Our Lady Kwanon and the Christ-like Jizo, who were the very essence of divine tenderness. Worship was only partly by prayer at the household altars and the temple shrines. A large part of it consisted of merry processions in which religion was subordinated to gaiety, and piety took the form of feminine fashion displays and masculine revelry. The more serious devotee might cleanse his spirit by praying for a quarter of an hour under a waterfall in the depth of winter, or he might go on pilgrimages from shrine to shrine of his sect, meanwhile feasting his soul on the beauty of his native land. For the Japanese could choose among many varieties of Buddhism. He might seek self-realization and bliss through the quiet practices of Zen, meditation. He might follow the fiery Nichiren into the Lotus sect and find salvation through learning the Lotus Law. And he might join the Spirit sect and fast and pray until Buddha appeared to him in the flesh. He might be comforted by the sect of the Pure Land and be saved by faith alone. Or he might find his way in patient pilgrimage to the monastery of Koyasan and attain paradise by being buried in ground made holy by the bones of Kobodaishi, the great scholar, saint, and artist who in the ninth century had founded Shingon, the sect of the true word. 
All in all, Japanese Buddhism was one of the pleasantest of man's myths. It conquered Japan peacefully and complacently found room within its theology and its pantheon for the doctrines and deities of Shinto. Buddha was amalgamated with Amaterasu, and a modest place was set apart in Buddhist temples for a Shinto shrine. The Buddhist priests of the earlier centuries were men of devotion, learning, and kindliness who profoundly influenced and advanced Japanese letters and art. Some of them were great painters or sculptors, and some were scholars whose painstaking translation of Buddhist and Chinese literature proved a fertile stimulus to the cultural development of Japan. Success, however, ruined the later priests. Many became lazy and greedy. Note the jolly caricatures so often made of them by Japanese carvers in ivory or wood. And some traveled so far from Buddha as to organize their own armies for the establishment or maintenance of political power. Since they were providing the first necessity of life, a consolatory hope, their industry flourished even when others decayed. Their wealth grew from century to century while the poverty of the people remained. The priests assured the faithful that a man of forty could purchase another decade of life by paying forty temples to say masses in his name. At fifty he could buy ten more years by engaging fifty temples, at sixty years sixty temples, and so till, through insufficient piety, he died. Under the Tokugawa regime, the monks drank bibulously, kept mistresses candidly, practiced pederasty, and sold the cozier places in the hierarchy to the highest bidders. During the 18th century, Buddhism seems to have lost its hold upon the nation. The shoguns went over to Confucianism, Mabuchi and Motoori led a movement for the restoration of Shinto, and scholars like Ichikawa and Arai Hakuseki attempted a rationalist critique of religious belief. Ichikawa argued boldly that verbal tradition could never be quite as trustworthy as written record, that writing had not come to Japan until almost a thousand years after the supposed origin of the islands and their inhabitants from the spear drops and loins of the gods, that the claim of the imperial family to divine origin was merely a political device, and that if the ancestors of men were not human beings, they were much more likely to have been animals than gods. The civilization of the old Japan, like so many others, had begun with religion, and was ending with philosophy. 7. The Thinkers Confucius reaches Japan, a critic of religion, the religion of scholarship, Kaibara Eken, on education, on pleasure, the rival schools, a Japanese Spinoza, Ito Jinsai, Ito Togai, Ogyu Sorai, the war of the scholars, Mabuchi, Moto Ori. Philosophy, like religion, came to Japan from China. And as Buddhism had reached Nippon 600 years after its entrance into the middle flowery people's kingdom, so philosophy in the form of Sung Confucianism awoke to consciousness in Japan almost 400 years after China had given it a second birth. About the middle of the 16th century, a scion of Japan's most famous family, Fujiwara Seigwa, discontent with the knowledge that he had received as a monk and having heard of great sages in China, resolved to go and study there. Intercourse with China having been forbidden in 1552, the young priest made plans to cross the water in a smuggling vessel. While waiting at an inn at the port, he overheard a student reading aloud in Japanese from a Chinese volume on Confucius. Seigua was overjoyed to find that the book was Chu Shi's commentary on the great learning. This, he exclaimed, is what I have so long desired. By sedulous searching, he obtained a copy of this and other products of Sung philosophy and became so absorbed in their discussions that he forgot to go to China. Within a few years, he had gathered about him a group of young scholars who looked upon the Chinese philosophers as the revelation of a brave new world of secular thought. Ieyasu heard of these developments and asked Seigua to come and expound to him the Confucian classics, but the proud priest, preferring the quiet of his study, sent a brilliant pupil in his place. Nevertheless, the more active-minded youths of his time made a pathway to his door, and his lectures attracted so much attention that the Buddhist monks of Kyoto complained saying it was an outrage that anyone but an orthodox and practicing priest should deliver public lectures or teach the people. The matter was simplified by Seigua's sudden death in 1619. The pupil whom he had sent to Ieyasu soon outranked him in fame and influence. The first Tokugawa shoguns took a fancy to Hayashi Razan and made him their counselor and the formulator of their public pronouncements. Iemitsu set a fashion for the nobility by attending Hayashi's lectures in 1630, and soon the young Confucian had so filled his hearers with enthusiasm for Chinese philosophy that he had no trouble in winning them from both Buddhism and Christianity to the simple moral creed bequeathed to the Far East by the sage of Shantung. 
Christian theology, he told them, was a medley of incredible fancies, while Buddhism was a degenerative doctrine that threatened to weaken the fiber and morale of the Japanese nation. You priest, said Razan, maintain that this world is impermanent and ephemeral. By your enchantments, you cause people to forget the social relations. You make an end of all the duties and all the proprieties. Then you proclaim, man's path is full of sins. Leave your father and mother, leave your master, leave your children, and seek for salvation. Now I tell you that I have studied much, but I have nowhere found that there was a path for a man apart from loyalty to one's lord and of filial piety towards one's parents. Hayashi was enjoying an old age of quiet renown when the great fire of Tokyo in 1657 included him among its hundred thousand casualties. His disciples ran to warn him of the danger, but he merely nodded his head and turned back to his book. When the flames were actually around him, he ordered a palanquin and was carried away in it while still reading his book. Like countless others, he passed that night under the stars, and three days later he died of the cold that he had caught during the conflagration. Nature sought to atone for his death by giving Japan, in the following year, one of the most enthusiastic of Confucians. Muro Kyuso chose as his patron deity the god of learning. Before Michizane's shrine he spent in his youth an entire night in prayer, and then he dedicated himself to knowledge with youthful resolutions strangely akin to those of his contemporary Spinoza. I will arise every morning at six o'clock and retire each evening at twelve o'clock. Except when prevented by guests, sickness, or other unavoidable circumstances, I will not be idle. I will not speak falsehoods. I will avoid useless words, even with inferiors. I will be temperate in eating and drinking. If lustful desires arise, I will destroy them at once without nourishing them at all. Wandering thought destroys the value of reading. I will be careful to guard against lack of concentration and over-haste. I will seek self-culture, not allowing my mind to be disturbed by the desire for fame or gain. Engraving these rules on my heart, I will attempt to follow them. The gods be my witness. Nevertheless, Cuso did not preach a scholastic seclusion, but with the broad-mindedness of a Goethe directed character into the stream of the world. Seclusion is one method and is good, but a superior man rejoices when his friends come. A man polishes himself by association with others. Every man who desires learning should seek to be polished in this way. But if he shuts himself away from everything and everybody, he is guilty of violating the great way. The way of the sages is not sundered from matters of everyday life. Though the Buddhists withdraw themselves from human relations, cutting out the relation of master and subject, parent and child, they are not able to cut out love from themselves. It is selfishness to seek happiness in the future world. Think not that God is something distant, but seek for him in your own hearts, for the heart is the abode of God. The most attractive of these early Japanese Confucians is not usually classed among the philosophers, for like Goethe and Emerson, he had the skill to praise his wisdom gracefully, and jealous literature claims him for her own. Like Aristotle, Kaibara Eken was the son of a physician, and passed from medicine to a cautious empirical philosophy. Despite a busy public career, including many official posts, he found time to become the greatest scholar of his day. His books numbered more than a hundred, and made him known throughout Japan, for they were written not in Chinese, then the language of his fellow philosophers, but in such simple Japanese that any literate person might understand them. Despite his learning and renown, he had, along with the vanity of every writer, the humility of every sage. Once, says tradition, a passenger on a vessel plying along the Japanese coast undertook to lecture to his fellow travelers on the ethics of Confucius. At first everyone attended with typical Japanese curiosity and eagerness to learn. But as the speaker went on, his audience, finding him a bore who had no nose for distinguishing a live fact from a dead one, melted swiftly away, until only one listener remained. This solitary auditor, however, followed the discourse with such devout concentration that the lecturer, having finished, inquired his name. Kaibara Eken was the quiet reply. The orator was abashed to discover that for an hour or more he had been attempting to instruct in Confucianism the most celebrated Confucian master of the age. Eken's philosophy was as free from theology as Kung's and clung agnostically to the earth. Foolish men, while doing crooked things, offer their prayers to questionable gods striving to obtain happiness. With him, philosophy was an effort to unify experience into wisdom and desire into character, and it seemed to him more pressing and important 
to unify character than to unify knowledge, he speaks with strangely contemporary pertinence. The aim of learning is not merely to widen knowledge, but to form character. Its object is to make us true men rather than learned men. The moral teaching, which was regarded as the trunk of all learning in the schools of the olden days, is hardly studied in our schools today because the numerous branches of study required. No longer do men deem it worthwhile to listen to the teachings of the hoary sages of the past. Consequently, the amiable relations between master and servant, superior and inferior, older and younger, are sacrificed on the altar of the God called individual right. The chief reason why the teachings of the sages are not more appreciated by the people is because scholars endeavor to show off their learning rather than to make it their endeavor to live up to the teachings of the sages. The young men of his time seem to have reproved him for his conservatism, for he flings at them a lesson which every vigorous generation has to relearn. Children, you may think an old man's words wearisome, yet when your father or grandfather teaches, do not turn your head away, but listen. Though you may think the tradition of your family stupid, do not break it into pieces, for it is the embodiment of the wisdom of your fathers. Perhaps he deserved reproof, for the most famous of his books, the Onadaikaku, or The Great Learning for Women, had a strong reactionary influence on the position of women in Japan. But he was no gloomy preacher intent on finding sin in every delight. He knew that one task of the educator is to teach us how to enjoy our environment, as well as, if we can, to understand and control it. Do not let a day slip by without enjoyment. Do not allow yourself to be tormented by the stupidity of others. Remember that from its earliest beginnings the world has never been free from fools. Let us not then distress ourselves, nor lose our pleasure, even though our own children, brothers and relations, happen to be selfish, ignoring our best efforts to make them otherwise. Sake is the beautiful gift of heaven. Drunk in small quantities, it expands the heart, lifts the downcast spirit, drowns cares, and improves the health. Thus it helps a man and also his friends to enjoy pleasures. But he who drinks too much loses his respectability, becomes over-talkative, and utters abusive words like a madman. Enjoy sake by drinking just enough to give you a slight exhilaration, and thus enjoy seeing flowers when they are just bursting into bloom. To drink too much and spoil this great gift of heaven is foolish. Like most philosophers, he found the last refuge of his happiness in nature. If we make our heart the fountainhead of pleasure, our eyes and ears the gates of pleasure, and keep away base desires, then our pleasure shall be plentiful for we can then become the master of mountain, water, moon, and flowers. We do not need to ask any man for them, neither to obtain them, need we pay a single sen. They have no specified owner. Those who can enjoy the beauty in the heaven above and the earth beneath need not envy the luxury of the rich, for they are richer than the richest. The scenery is constantly changing. No two mornings or two evenings are quite alike. At this moment one feels as if all the beauty of the world had gone but then the snow begins to fall, and one awakens the next morning to find the village and the mountains transformed into silver, while the once bare trees seem alive with flowers. Winter resembles the night's sleep, which restores our strength and dignity. Loving flowers, I rise early. Loving the moon, I retire late. Men come and go like passing streams, but the moon remains throughout the ages. In Japan, even more than in China, the influence of Confucius on philosophic thought overwhelmed all the resistance of unplaced rebels on the one hand and mystic idealists on the other. The Shushi school of Seigwa, Razan, and Eken took its name from Chu Shi and followed his orthodox and conservative interpretation of the Chinese classics. For a time it was opposed by the Oyome school, which took its lead from Wang Yangming, known to Nippon as Oyome. Like Wang, the Japanese philosophers of Oyome sought to deduce right and wrong from the conscience of the individual rather than from the traditions of society and the teachings of the ancient sages. I had for many years been a devout believer in Shushi, says Nakaye Toju, 1608-1648, when by the mercy of heaven the collected works of Oyome were brought for the first time to Japan. Had it not been for the aid of their teaching, my life would have been empty and barren. So Nakaye devoted himself to expounding an idealist monism in which the world was a unity of ki and ri, of thing or modes, and reason or law. God and this unity were one, 
The world of things was his body, the universal law was his soul. Like Spinoza, Wang Yangming, and the scholastics of Europe, Nakaye accepted this universal law with a kind of amor de intellectualis, and accounted good and evil as human terms and prejudices describing no objective entities. And again, strangely like Spinoza, he found a certain immortality in the contemplative union of the individual spirit with the timeless laws or reason of the world. Man's mind is the mind of the sensible world, but we have another mind which is called conscience. This is reason itself and does not belong to form or mode. It is infinite and eternal. As our conscience is one with the divine or universal reason, it has no beginning or end. If we act in accord with such reason or conscience, we are ourselves the incarnations of the infinite and eternal, and have eternal life. Nakaye was a man of saintly sincerity, but his philosophy pleased neither the people nor the government. The shogun had trembled at the notion that every man might judge for himself what was right and what was wrong. When another exponent of Oyome, Kumazawa Banzan, passed from metaphysics to politics and criticized the ignorance and idleness of the samurai, an order was sent out for his arrest. Kumazawa, recognizing the importance of the heels as a specially philosophical organ, fled to the mountains and passed most of his remaining years in sylvan obscurity. In 1795 an edict went forth against the further teaching of the Oyome philosophy, and so docile was the mind of Japan that from that time on Oyome concealed itself within the phrases of Confucianism, or entered as a modest component into that military Zen which, by a typical paradox of history, transformed the pacific faith of Buddha into the inspiration of patriotic warriors. As Japanese scholarship developed and became directly acquainted with the writings of Confucius rather than merely with his Sung interpreters, men like Itō Jinsai and Ogyu Sōrai established the classical school of Japanese thought, which insisted on going over the heads of all commentators to the great Kung himself. Itō Jinsai's family did not agree with him about the value of Confucius. They taunted him with the impracticability of his studies and predicted that he would die in poverty. Scholarship, they told him, belongs to the Chinese. It is useless in Japan. Even though you obtain it, you cannot sell it. Far better become a physician and make money. The young student listened without hearing. He forgot the rank and wealth of his family, put aside all material ambition, gave his house and property to a younger brother, and went to live in solitude so that he might study without distraction. He was handsome and was sometimes mistaken for a prince, but he dressed like a peasant and shunned the public eye. Jinsai, says a Japanese historian, was very poor, so poor that at the end of the year he could not make New Year's rice cakes, but he was very calm about it. His wife came and, kneeling down before him, said, I will do the housework under any circumstances, but there is one thing that is unbearable. Our boy Genso does not understand the meaning of our poverty. He envies the neighbor's children their rice cakes. I scold him, but my heart is torn in two. Jinsai continued to pore over his books without making any reply. Then, taking off his garnet ring, he handed it to his wife, as much as to say, sell this and buy some rice cakes. At Kyoto, Jinsai opened a private school and lectured there for forty years, training all in all some three thousand students in philosophy. He spoke occasionally of metaphysics, and described the universe as a living organism in which life always overrode death. But like Confucius, he had a warm prejudice in favor of the terrestrial practical. That which is useless in governing the state or in walking in the way of human relations is useless. Learning must be active and living. Learning must not be mere dead theory or speculation. Those who know the way seek it in their daily life. If apart from human relations we hope to find the way, it is like trying to catch the wind. The ordinary way is excellent, there is no more excellent in the world. After the death of Jinsai, his school and work were carried on by his son, Ito Togai. Togai laughed at fame and said, How can you help calling a man whose name is forgotten as soon as he dies an animal or sand? But is it not a mistake for a man to be eager to make books or construct sentences in order that his name may be admired and may not be forgotten? He wrote 242 volumes, but for the rest he lived a life of modesty and wisdom. The critics complained that these books were strong in what Moliere called virtus dormitiva. Nevertheless, Togai's pupils pointed out that he had written 242 books without saying an unkind word of any other philosopher. When he died, they placed this enviable epitaph upon his tomb. He did not talk about the faults of others. He cared for nothing but books. 
his life was uneventful. The greatest of these later Confucians was Ogyusorai. As he himself put the matter, from the time of Jimu, the first emperor of Japan, how few scholars have been my equal. Unlike Togai, he enjoyed controversy and spoke his mind violently about philosophers living or dead. When an inquiring young man asked him, What do you like besides reading? He answered, There is nothing better than eating burnt beans and criticizing the great men of Japan. Sorai, said Nami Kawa Tenjin, is a very great man, but he thinks that he knows all that there is to be known. This is a bad habit. Ogyu could be modest when he wished. All the Japanese, he said explicitly, including himself, were barbarians. Only the Chinese were civilized. And if there is anything that ought to be said, it has already been said by the ancient kings or Confucius. The samurai and the scholars raged at him, but the reformer shogun, Yoshimune, enjoyed his courage and protected him against the intellectual mob. Sorai set up his rostrum at Yedo, and like Shun Tse, denouncing the sentimentality of Moti, or Hobbes refuting Rousseau before Rousseau's birth, flung his laughing logic at Jin Tsai, who had announced that man is naturally good. On the contrary, said Sorai, man is a natural villain and grasps whatever he can reach. Only artificial morals and laws and merciless education turn him into a tolerable citizen. As soon as men are born, desires spring up. When we cannot realize our desires, which are unlimited, struggle arises. When struggle arises, confusion follows. As the ancient kings hated confusion, they founded propriety and righteousness, and with these governed the desires of the people. Morality is nothing but the necessary means for controlling the subjects of the empire. It did not originate with nature, nor with the impulses of man's heart, but it was devised by the superior intelligence of certain sages, and authority was given to it by the state. As if to confirm the pessimism of Sorai, Japanese thought in the century that followed him fell even from the modest level to which its imitation of Confucius had raised it, and lost itself in a bitter ink-shedding war between the idolaters of China and the worshippers of Japan. In this battle of the ancients against the moderns, the moderns won by their superior admiration of antiquity. The Kangakusha, or pro-Chinese scholars, called their own country barbarous, argued that all wisdom was Chinese, and contented themselves with translating and commenting upon Chinese literature and philosophy. The Wagakusha, or pro-Japanese scholars, denounced this attitude as obscurantist and unpatriotic, and called upon the nation to turn its back upon China and renew its strength at the sources of its own poetry and history. Mabuchi attacked the Chinese as an inherently vicious people, exalted the Japanese as naturally good, and attributed the lack of early or native Japanese literature and philosophy to the fact that the Japanese did not need instruction in virtue or intelligence. Inspired by a visit to Mabuchi, a young physician by the name of Moto Ori Norinaga devoted 34 years to writing a 44-volume commentary on the Kojiki, or Records of Ancient Events the classical repository of Japanese, especially of Shinto legends. This commentary, the Kojiki Den, was a vigorous assault upon everything Japanese, in or out of Japan. It boldly upheld the literal truth of the primitive stories that recounted the divine origin of the Japanese island, emperors, and people. And under the very eyes of the Tokugawa regents, it stimulated among the intellectuals of Japan that movement back to their own language, ways, and traditions, which was ultimately to revive Shinto as against Buddhism and restore the supremacy of the emperors over the shoguns. Japan, wrote Moto Ori, is the country which gave birth to the goddess of the sun, Amaterasu, and this fact proves its superiority over all other countries. His pupil, Hirata, carried on the argument after Moto Ori's death. It is most lamentable that so much ignorance should prevail as to the evidences of the two fundamental doctrines that Japan is the country of the gods, and her inhabitants the descendants of the gods. Between the Japanese people and the Chinese, Hindus, Russians, Dutch, Siamese, Cambodians, and other nations of the world, there is a difference of kind rather than of degree. It was not out of vainglory that the inhabitants of this country called it the land of the gods. The gods who created all countries belonged, without exception, to the divine age, and were all born in Japan, so that Japan is their native country, and all the world acknowledges the appropriateness of the title. The Koreans were the first to become acquainted with this truth, and from them it was gradually diffused through the globe and accepted by everyone. Foreign countries were, of course, produced by the power of the Creator gods, but they were not begotten by Izanagi and Izanami, 
nor did they give birth to the goddess of the sun, which is the cause of their inferiority. Such were the men and the opinions that established the sonojo e movement to honor the emperor and expel the foreign barbarians. In the 19th century, that movement inspired the Japanese people to overthrow the shogunate and re-establish the supremacy of the divine house. In the 20th, it plays a living role in nourishing that fiery patriotism which will not be content until the Son of Heaven rules all the fertile millions of the resurrected East. Chapter 30. The Mind and Art of Old Japan 1. Language and Education The Language, Writing, Education Meanwhile, the Japanese had borrowed their systems of writing and education from the barbarian Chinese. Their language was peculiarly their own, presumably Mongolian and akin to the Korean, but not demonstrably derived from this or any other known tongue. It differed especially from the Chinese in being polysyllabic and agglutinative, and yet simple. It had few aspirates, no gutturals, no compound or final consonants, except N, and almost every vowel was melodiously long. The grammar, too, was a natural and easy system. It dispensed with number and gender in its nouns, with degrees of comparison in its adjectives, and with personal inflections in its verbs. It had few personal pronouns and no relative pronouns at all. On the other hand, there were inflections of negation and mood in adjectives and verbs. Troublesome postpositions, modifying suffixes, were used instead of prepositions, and complex honorifics like your humble servant and your excellency took the place of the first and second personal pronouns. The language dispensed even with writing, apparently, until Koreans and Chinese brought the art to Japan in the early centuries of our era, and then the Japanese were content for hundreds of years to express their Italianly beautiful speech in the ideographs of the Middle Kingdom. Since a complete Chinese character had to be used for each syllable of a Japanese word, Japanese writing in the Nara age was very nearly the most laborious ever known. During the ninth century, that law of economy which determines so much of philology brought to the relief of Japan two simplified forms of writing. In each of them, a Chinese character, shortened into cursive form, was used to represent one of the 47 syllables that constitute the spoken speech of Japan, and this syllabary of 47 characters served instead of an alphabet. The katakana script reduced these syllabic syllables to straight lines, as in the tabloid press, the larger billboards, and the illuminated signs of modern Japan. Since a large part of Japanese literature is in Chinese, and most of the remainder is written not in the popular syllabary, but in a combination of Chinese characters and native alphabets, few Western scholars have been able to master it in the original. Our knowledge of Japanese literature is consequently fragmentary and deceptive, and our judgments of it can be of little worth. The Jesuits, harassed with these linguistic barriers, reported that the language of the islands had been invented by the devil to prevent the preaching of the gospel to the Japanese. Printing, like writing, came from China as part of Buddhist lore. The oldest extant examples of printing in the world are some Buddhist charms block printed at the command of the Empress Shotoku in the year 770 A.D. Movable type entered from Korea about 1596, but the expense involved in printing a language still composed of thousands of characters kept its use from spreading until the restoration of 1858 opened the doors to European influence. Even today, a Japanese newspaper requires a font of several thousand characters. Japanese typography, despite these difficulties, is one of the most attractive forms of printing in our time. Writing remained for a long time a luxury of the higher classes. Until the latter part of the 19th century, no pretense was made of spreading the art among the people. In the Kyoto age, the rich families maintained schools for their children and the emperors Tenchi and Momu, at the beginning of the 8th century, established at Kyoto the first Japanese university. Gradually, a system of provincial schools was developed under governmental control. Their graduates were eligible to enter the university, and those graduates of the university who passed the required tests became eligible for public office. The civil wars of the early feudal period broke down this educational progress, and Japan neglected the arts of the mind until the Tokugawa shogunate reorganized peace and encouraged learning and literature. Ieyasu was scandalized to find that 90% of the samurai could not read or write. In 1630, Hayashi Razan established at Yedo a training school in public administration and Confucian philosophy, which later developed into the University of Tokyo. And Kumazawa, in 1666, founded at Shizutani the first provincial college. By allowing teachers to wear the sword and boast the rank of the samurai, 
the government induced students, doctors, and priests to set up private schools in homes or temples for the provision of elementary education. In 1750, there were 800 such schools with some 40,000 students. All these institutions were for the sons of the samurai. Merchants and peasants had to be content with popular lecturers, and only prosperous women received any formal education. Universal education in Japan as in Europe had to wait for the needs and compulsions of an industrial life. 2. Poetry. The manyoshu, the kokinshu, characteristics of Japanese poetry, examples, the game of poetry, the hoka gamblers. The earliest Japanese literature that has come down to us is poetry, and the earliest Japanese poetry is, by native scholars, accounted the best. One of the oldest and most famous of Japanese books is the manyoshu, or Book of Ten Thousand Leaves, in which two editors collected into twenty volumes some 4,500 poems composed during the preceding four centuries. Here in particular appeared the work of Hitomaro and Akahito, the chief poetic glories of the Nara age. When his beloved died and the smoke from the funeral pyre ascended into the hills, Hitomaro wrote an elegy briefer than in memoriam. Oh, is it my beloved, the cloud that wanders in the ravine of the deep secluded Hatsuse mountain? A further effort to preserve Japanese poetry from time's mortality was made by Emperor Daigo, who brought together 1,100 poems of the preceding 150 years into an anthology known as the Kokinshu, Poems Ancient and Modern. This book is continued on Cassette 12, Side 1.